Commerce. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and and uh, uh, committee. Uh, I'm excited to be here. We've now. today's been a. Oh. I've got a call. <laughs> is, is it something I said? <laughs> no. I'm sorry. I will be right back, though. I've got a few bills in. So, Vice Chair Sullivan will take over. <laughs> well, look at me so. For the record, uh, Jim Kondo, Secretary of State, with me is my deputy, Chris Winters. Also, Marlene Batti is our corporations, IT, uh, I, corporations director. And Alex Ivey has been our business analyst on the um, uh, business portal. So today what I'm here actually is to talk in general about the office and kind of fill you in. And then I hope that we'll be able to come back to talk about the business portal in more detail with you. We'll, be, we'll give you some very brief stuff today. But uh, for the most part, I just want to talk really about the office. Uh, because there are some new members, and I think it's always good that uh, we provide that information. So thanks for the opportunity to provide you the overview. Our responsibilities are many and very diverse. Most people don't know what the Secretary of State's office does beyond elections. In fact, it's probably the number one question I get during the campaign season. What does the Secretary of State do? And to put it a little bit in perspective, when I was first sworn in as Secretary of State in 2011, um, I brought my parents up from Florida, uh, and my father on the way back to the airport turned to me and he goes, does this mean that you work for Hillary now? <laughs> and I said, no, Dad, different secretary. <laughs> so uh, he then promptly smacked me on the back of the head and said, don't get cocky with me. <laughs> so. Um, as a former state senator and a chair of the Senate Government Operations Committee, I fully understand and appreciate the important work that the legislature does and, and all the important work that goes on committee by committee. Now with eight years behind me as Vermont Secretary of State and head of what I consider to be a very important agency, I have a greater appreciation every day for the idea of and necessity of smart and focused government. Specifically, the role that it plays with interagency government operations, commerce and economic development, and most importantly, the integrity and trust of our citizens. Um, setting public policy is one thing, but enacting that policy is in a smart way too often gets lost. We are proud of the collaborative and nonpartisan relationship we have had with legislative committees over the years. Good government knows no political labels, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, I also have over 30 years of uh, uh, private sector background working for a Fortune 100 company as well as a uh, Vermont-based distribution company that generated over $100 million in sales uh, and for a regulated utility. So my background is very diverse as well. As Vermont's 38th Secretary of State and head of the agency touching so many people, uh, I'm honored to continue to work, to move forward working towards open, transparent government, good government solutions that are well designed, efficient, customer friendly, while still protecting the citizens that we serve. For example, our office uh, is well known for having implemented six different IT solutions in my time. We completed a website overhaul, a corporations, a new corporation system, including the rudimentary business portal that we currently have, elections, campaign finance, lobbying, professional regulation, and accessible voting. And we did those all on budget, and they're all working well. Um, we, we operate on a very fiscally constrained budget. That's Marlene's job is to keep me in line, uh, and well thought out. We eliminated, back in 2012-13 timeframe, we eliminated 1.8 million in general fund dollars that we were receiving. And really it was just an accounting um, issue. We would, on July 1st, 1.8 million would get dumped into the Secretary of State's fund and we'd operate off of that. July, June 30th, whatever we had, which usually was more than 1.8 million, would get swept away. 
the next day we'd get 1.8 million back. And it was just this constant uh, um, entry, in, in, uh, accounting entry that had to be done. We realized, actually in my first five minutes as Secretary of State, when I sat down with my budget, an, uh, budget director at the time, I, said, I stopped him and I said, excuse me, why do we get the 1.8 million? And he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? And I says, well, it seems to me we can operate right off the fees that we already generate. And he says, oh, you understand this. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not rocket science, but in any case, we gave back to the legislature 1.8 million. The only general fund dollars that we use or get is in an election year, we get about 400,000, and that's to help us with uh, ballot printing. Other than that, we're self-funded. And I'll get in a little bit later, I'll tell you how much we actually give back. We operate on our fees, we operate within our budget that we develop and you approve. When I say that, the legislature as a whole. And one thing that I've been very proud of is the fact that the Secretary of State's office under my watch has never been before appropriations for budget adjustment in January. Um, that means we operate under the budget we have. As you probably know, we have four divisions at the Secretary of State's office. The Office of Professional Regulation, better known as OPR. Uh, they protect the public's health and safety through professional regulation, leading the way with efficient, effective licensing and enforcement. Basara, the State Archives, uh, preserving and protecting our state's most valued history, public records, and access to those public records, and working collaboratively with state government on public records management. Um, elections, obviously, safeguarding the integrity and accuracy of our elections while increasing voter participation and creating more effective election administration. And corporations, ensuring the proper registration and public protection while facilitating business and commerce in, in Vermont. Our fifth division is actually Marlene's other half, and that's the administration office, business office. She makes sure that we live within our means, uh, provide true accounting of our budgets and the resources needed to provide services. And we do have on our website, you can actually access our, bu our budgets. So we, we post that on our website. In addition to these divisions, we also have some other programs. Uh, our municipal uh, division or the municipal uh, program fields inquiries every day from municipal officials and many of your constituents all across the state. We receive over 1,200 calls per day, and that includes some of our publications. Uh, I'm sorry, 1,200 <laughs> calls a year, <laughs> including publications. I was trying to work on this. Yeah, the <laughs> next step was to ask them for money. <laughs> uh, public records and open meetings. Uh, as many of you may know, I do what we call the transparency tour every other year. We're now over 50 stops around the state. Um, where we actually explain public records law and open meeting laws. And we have the Safe at Home program, providing address confidentiality for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. We have over 150 participants, uh, that's men, women, and children that are on that list. Uh, essentially, they use our office uh, as their legal address and they all their mail comes to us, we then repackage it and send it to the correct address. That list is kept in a safe um, uh, so that nobody else can get access to it. So we don't put it on our website or any place else. And I just, I always like to tell this story because it's, it's, it really talks about how important the Safe at Home program is. First of all, we were the third state in the country to actually implement it. Um, back around 2000 or 2001. Um, about three or four years ago, we had a call that came in and the person that was managing the program called me up and said, I got a really upset guy on the phone that's insisting I give him information. And I said, okay, send it up. This guy told me I'm in law enforcement, I know how these programs work, and I insist that you give me this information on this woman and her child. We, we need to do a welfare check. And I said, that's great. I says, you, he was from out of state. I says, you know, the, you know the process. If you have a court order, 
file it with me and I'll, I'll review it and we'll release the information. He's okay, never received anything. Um, a week later he called and I think he must have thought Vermont was a big place because he thought he was going to get somebody else. He got me again. <laughs> and uh, I explained to him that last week I told you I needed uh -huh. the court order and you didn't send it to me. And he says, well, he says, I'm in law enforcement and I know how this stuff works. And I said, that's fine. Something just didn't seem right. So I called the state police and I asked them to do a welfare check on the woman and her daughter. Uh, it was in southern Vermont. Not your side, the other side. <laughs> your side. <laughs> um, and uh, the state police went and checked it out to make sure that the family was okay. And then reported back to me. The guy that was calling me was the estranged husband who was in law enforcement of the woman and child. Um, and I'm just so pleased that we were able to protect that family uh, from any potential harm. And that's, that's the meaning of that program. It really does work. Uh, we also have the temporary officiant program, uh, which allows individuals to register with our office so that they can perform a single marriage. Started out with less than a thousand. We're now over 1,500 per year. Uh, that system is now up online and can, you can access it on a 24-7 basis. Um, during the busy spring, summer, and fall, we receive anywhere from 40 to 90 applications per day. Mr. Secretary, can I add something? Sure. I had a food cart in Bennington, and this couple met at my food cart, and when they decided they wanted to get married, they did it at my cart. <laughs> <laughs> Were you the uh, I was the <laughs> uh, And that program, by the way, brings in about $150,000 to the state. Um, we also maintain the, uh, the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, rules and legislative clerk duties. The rules are when uh, agencies file rules that they're going to operate under, they have to file it through us. We make sure that they file them correctly, make sure that they've done the public outreach, uh, and then report back to um, LCAR uh, to make sure that, that they have, before they approve it. So. With that in mind, let me quickly go over a few of our major initiatives. Uh, the Corporations Division is responsible for registration of business entities, from small proprietorship, as such as trade names, to the in in full incorporation process. It's also the filing repository for uniform commercial code filings for the state of Vermont. The Corporations Division, by the way, they have five people. They do over 100,000 unique transactions per year. They've had no fee increases since 2014. Every year at the end of the year, a general fund sweep occurs out of, pretty much out of their fund. Um, and in FY17, the general fund received about 2.8 million. And in FY18, it was just under 2.75 million. Um, we also, in this past year, implemented what we call the one-click filing of annual reports. Uh, which is when you have to file, every business has to file an annual report on January to March. If you have had no changes to your filing in the previous year, you can just hit one click and be on your way. One click, submit your credit card information and away you go. Whereas before you used to have to fill in the whole form and everything else, all the details. Uh, so we're really pleased with that, and we're now over 60% uh, of our filings for annual reports are done through that process. Uh, so that really is, it allows businesses to focus on their business rather than focusing on the paperwork for the state. Um, we continue to work with Department of Tax and Department of Labor, uh, specifically in labor, it's the unemployment division, on the shared business portal and service to the customer base. We, this past year, we implemented the first uh, nation, first in the nation registration of data brokers, and we're just in its infancy at this point. Our business portal, um, let's see, I was going to talk a little bit about the other, but okay. So let me just back up a little bit, just describe, in 2011, and I knew this because I had been in the Senate for so many years, uh, in 2011, we were getting ready to 
uh, put a, a new IT system in place for corporations. And the vendor we were using said, hey, you know, this is a great time to do, you know, a, a basic business portal. So we approached the Shumlin administration, and it had been tried by Dean, it had been tried by Douglas, nobody could ever seem to get their hands on it. But because we were putting our new corporation system in place, it made the perfect time to actually do this. So that it was very basic from the standpoint of when you're starting a business, you put in your name, your address, your DBA, all your contact information, and guess what? When you go to the tax department after you leave the Secretary of State's registration, you have to give them your name, your address, your DBA, and all this stuff. What we did basically was set it up so that the stuff would carry over, the information that was pertinent would carry over, and that what it would do is it would just ask, when you got to the tax department, when you're going for your tax ID, it would ask the specific questions that you needed to answer for tax. When it got to labor, it would ask the specific questions for labor. Then last year, um, the, this committee and, and uh, um, the Senate uh, uh, Commerce uh, Economic Development Committee asked us to look into a business portal. They set up uh, a steering committee with me as chair um, and Mike Sherling, uh, ACCD, and John Quinn from ADS uh, to move forward on uh, a plan the legislature also gave us a uh, authorization for someone to do that work for us. That's Alex, um, and we um, proceeded. And you should have uh, a report already uh, on file with the legislature. We we submitted it on December fourteenth uh, to talk about what we could do. Alex did a tremendous amount of work reaching out to organizations, reaching out to businesses, reaching out to uh, agencies about, you know, what are the next steps? And, and talking with, we talked, I know that Alex and Chris talked with other states, Indiana, um, um, Georgia, and who are, Nevada, who already have operating systems. Um, and we talked with, um, some of the, uh, San Francisco was it? Francisco. Yeah, San Francisco, which has a business portal for their own uh, city. Um, and the report is the culmination of that. And I, I have to, I want to give thanks to Alex because that report, I think, is one of the finest reports sent to a legislature that I've seen in my time. Uh, and I've been in this building since 2001. So, um, and I know how many reports are filed. <laughs> There's no way we could all read them. When you get a chance, you're still chair, aren't you still chair of the National Association? I am president of the National president. Association of Secretaries. Could Secretaries. you talk a little bit about the, secur the, the, the security of our election and also sort of an overview of what's happening nationally because you actually know? Sure. Uh, as At many some of point when you Okay, yeah, I'll get into that, I think. Let me hold off and go through the rest of this first and then I'll get back to it. Okay. Uh, our goal with the business portal and the goal that the committees charged us with, this committee and the House and the Senate committee, was to try to simplify the process, to make it easier for businesses to actually run their businesses and not have to focus on filing paper with the state. Um, you know, just to give you an example, when we first took office, when I first took office, uh, I walked into the office and on the top of one of the clerk's desks was a stack of paper this high with a check attached to each piece of paper. It was annual report time. In those days, it would take 10 to 12 weeks to process all of that. And when I asked how quick did the checks get processed, they said, well, we process them as we process the paper. So 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, we had to hire temporaries to be on staff, to come on staff to actually input the data because we didn't have a, a very good system. Um, it was clunky, it was inaccurate, it was messy, it was, I, I, I can't describe it, it was just bad. Um, today, when you file your annual report, when you hit submit, it's done. It's up, it's posted, uh, the, the, the check is already deposited in the bank. Uh, we, we used to accept only check and cash or drawdown. 
And what we ended up doing is uh, we accept all forms of payment, bank to bank, um, credit card, everything, all kinds of credit cards. Uh, so, you know, we just improved everything so much. And, and I, I have to say that it also helped us with our revenues because now we were capturing, for sure, capturing all of our revenues. Um, so we're, we're the, the report, we'll come back to talk about the report in more detail, but the report basically lays it out. Uh, we, we did do an RFI um, to find out what are we talking about here with vendors. We got, was it three, three replies back? And the range was, you know, uh, I, I, hate to, I hate to say it in terms of for media purposes, but, uh, you know, I did, you know, they, I was asked at one point how much is that going to cost us, and I said it could be one million or it could be ten million. And of course, the headline was it's going to cost ten million. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not that wasn't fair. Um, it depends on what level of system we put into place, and how many agencies actually get on board. Um, and the only way that this is going to work, because you can't do it all at once, the only way to, that this will work is if you phase it in as separate projects going along the way. Um, so in any case, I'll continue on. Um, we, as I said, we have the data brokers uh, up and running, and uh, any corpse legislation that we have will come through this committee. So if we have anything that needs to be addressed, addressed or updated, it will come through this committee. Um, I'm not going to. I'll just briefly talk about like the Office of Professional Regulation: 50 professions, 70,000 licenses. This year we, we just uh, enacted the uh, notary publics, but we have over time, over the last couple of years, we've added uh, some licensing out of the Department of Environmental Conservation, Foresters, which was newly licensed, LADCs, the li licensed alcohol and drug counselors. Uh, we, that one we're especially proud of because we worked um, with the um, licensees we were able to take 30 pages of rules and reduce it to 10 pages. It's been a real boon from the standpoint of making it easier to get people licensed and operating in that field. So it's an economic workforce development uh, piece. Uh, and we're, we're working that way now. We, have a, we were awarded this past year, um, last summer, a grant of $450,000 over three years from the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, to conduct work uh, specifically on uh, continue work on the LADCs, but also on cosmetology, funeral, and real estate, um, and how do we can uh, streamline those and make them more efficient as well? Um, we are considered. Can I you for a second? Sure. Me. We're still in kitty. We'll be raising this for keep the farm going up against the The community hearings for contractors, is that through your office? Yes. Okay. And, and that's that's one that's, that that will be in the upcoming uh, OPR bill, which will be coming out. Right. So I'll just say, Jim, that's going to be a separate bill from the OPR bill. Oh, it is separate. Yeah, home okay. improvement contractors, and we think it's going to start on the Senate side. Um, Senator Sorokin has been an advocate of this for a while. It's going to start in Government Operations Committee, though, I, I believe. And we did extensive outreach with that, um, as well as, to be honest with you, a lot of the, the um, responsible contractors are actually in favor of this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what we're doing, basically, just to give you a little bit of a heads up, is it's going to be basically a very minimal approach. It's going to be a registration, and you have to provide uh, your insurances so that we know that you have insurance. And, and that you have a contract that you can, a model contract that you use or whatever. Uh, other than that, it's really not going to be, we're not going to whack people, uh, you know, for, viol for violating. It's not a license, so to speak. It's, it's a very minimal. And that's really the key to the Office of Professional Regulation. Vermont's OPR is considered a model for the nation. It was considered that way by the Obama administration when they did a, a, a white paper on it. Uh, but also, CSG and NCSL, Chris goes often to many conferences to talk about how we're doing it in Vermont. And we've worked closely with the legislature to, 
we not only have a sunrise review for when you want to add a license, but we also have a sunset to when we want to reduce or eliminate a license. Um, and we'll get we we can get into more on that, but it, there really is uh, 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 some. Um, there was a court decision, the North Carolina Dental Supreme Court decision, that. Uh, uh, basically was looking at, at how some of these commissions and boards basically are protecting their their life their profession by restricting the ability of other people to get into it and it was it was considered a um, what's the phrase restraint of trade yeah. you're also doing some wonderful work with the military and OPR has done and you're continuing to do that to look at particular Training the MOS or military um, designations, and then being able to transition them into a licensed profession in Vermont, and that's also that's actually groundbreaking and the first in the nation stuff. It's wonderful. So um, yeah, so we're, there's a lot that we've been doing to try to, you know, and we've been working closely with the governor on on much of this as well. Um, really, if you look at some of the other states, uh, many of the other states. They have one place where you go for licensing and registrations. Whereas here in Vermont, we have 50 professions. There's another 30, 40 throughout state government. You really have to know where to go in order to, to find out more about your license or whatever. You have to know where, where you have to go. Whereas in many states, it's, it's one location. I remember I was at a, uh, a secretary's conference in, in uh, Austin, Texas, and I looked up, I was right across from uh, the hotel was this building, and it said the Office of Registration and Licensing, and I'm, wow, and I, you know, it was, it was, uh, they've made it really simple from that standpoint, that, that they have one place where you go for registration and licensing, and, you know, we're already having conversations with Department of Liquor Control, with, potentially with the Ag Department, uh, about some of their licensing uh, as well, it's just it makes sense. We have got it down to a science. We we know what we're doing with it. It's we're efficient. And I just give you some quick numbers. In 2000, was it 2003? 2003, we had 35 professions. So we're almost we're a little about 40 percent more now. But we had 35 professions and only 35,000 license holders. And we had. 35 employees. In 2014, 10 years later, uh, we had 50 professions and we had, well, at that time, 60,000 licensees. So we'd almost doubled everything and we had almost the same number of employees. And the reason is because we use technology to offset and become more efficient and more accurate, actually. The, the amazing part for me, even with our election systems, is that um, the technology allows you to be more accurate by far, besides the efficiency. Uh, we also have the State Archives and Records Administration. Oh, sorry, just, um, uh, just to clarify, you're, when, you're, when you're saying that uh, how's the licensing in your shop, you're, you're, not, you're advocating to train, do the training and all that stuff, that would stay with the, with that, with the home. Uh, you, a department or minister or agency, you would just be handling the administration. Out the license part. We right. we handle the administration of the license, right? Right. And everything else is done. Like if there's a training involved or something, it like could that, be yes. It, it depends on how it's set up, right. and I mean ultimately that's up to the legislature to make those decisions. Right. Uh, so the archives we have our we pr we protect our most precious documents as well as offer. Uh, other state agencies, uh, records management, um, um, training. Um, you know, we, we've been up, upping our game on digital archives, uh, putting a lot of, uh, every day there's more stuff on our website than ever before. You can now access newspapers back to the 17, late 1700s. Um, uh, and, and Vermonters can access that for free. Um, it's done through Ancestry.com. They, they did all the scanning and, and uploading. Um, and and uh, uh, one of the deals was 
because they wanted access to the newspapers, and one of the deals was, okay, well, Vermonters get access to them, and that's how we got a hold of it. So there's a lot go that, that the Office of State Archives does, uh, and, and we're certainly, we operate a record center. It's got over 100,000 cubic feet of, of records, uh, as well as the archive itself. Um, one of the things that's kind of an awesome thing, I remember when I first was elected as secretary and I went out there and Greg Sanford was a former um, uh, state archivist and he took me out to the archive into the vault. It's a climate controlled vault and he hands me this document. It was in a plastic sheet and I'm looking at it and I, holy cow, this is the original constitution of the state of Vermont. Um, and it, it just, you know, it wows you when you, when you actually see that document, when you know that it's there, that it's been protected. Um, and I, <laughs> there was a time when the archives were in the basement of the pavilion building, and then it moved from the basement of the pavilion building to the basement of Terrace Street, where our office used to be located. And in both basements, you had water pipes and sewer pipes going right through the archive. When the when the uh, flood of two of uh, what was it the early 1990s uh, here in Montpelier, um, legislators were over at the archive helping get the, all the documents and stuff up to a higher higher location to protect them. Um, so it's just. What we have done, we've now got, it's out in Middlesex, it's, it's a state-of-the-art facility. It looks like a warehouse, but it's, it's a state-of-the-art facility out there, climate controlled, uh, and we're very proud of the work that we've been doing out there. A lot of states have been actually reducing or eliminating their archives, um, but we've been going the other way. Um, elections, you asked about elections, so let me, sure. Um, do you advise other agencies on their own records? Yes. Okay. And keeping them in compliance with shredding and all the... Uh, well, shredding, we offer them shred, guidance on it. Guidance. Okay. We don't control it, but no, we I offer them... Yeah. We wish we did, but we, we offer them guidance. So, um, in the elections area, two years ago, actually two and a half years ago now, uh, the world of secretaries of state, this is in response to your question, the world of the secretaries of state across this country changed and changed drastically. Uh, we were called to a phone, a, a, a conference call with the Department of Homeland Security, Secretary of State, a uh, Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, was on the phone with us and informed us that 21 states had been uh, attacked. They suspected the Russians. There was only one state that they knew of that was breached, um, and that they would. They were considering putting elections under critical infrastructure designation. We didn't know what that meant. We thought it, this was going to be a federal takeover of our elections. Um, so we had lots of questions. It took almost a year before they actually answered them. They did, in January of, uh, of 17, declare us a critical infrastructure, uh, and we still didn't know what that meant. It was not until June or July of 17 that we actually got information to explain to us that there were going to be more resources available to us. Vermont, though, I will say, we were well ahead of the game. In 2013, we had actually started to focus on cybersecurity um, well before we actually implemented our new election system. And so we were well ahead of the game, uh, and we were working hard on our cybersecurity at that time. We did a complete vulnerability and risk assessment of both physical as well as cyber of all three of our facilities. Um, so we really were a leader as far as secretaries of state across the country. Um, this past year, past election in 2018, um, I will just say no news was good news. There was no breaches that we are aware of. Uh, in, in either case, there was certainly no votes that were changed. We know that. Um, uh, what, what occurred in 2016 was an attempt to get into our voter registration databases. Part of our new system, we not only, on our voter registration database, we not only back it up every night, 
but we also have something called same day voter registration so nobody will be denied on election day so that's some of the redundancy that we put in place we also uh, well, we're now one of 40 states, but we were, we have been um, a state that's considered to be a voter mark paper ballot. We also do post-election audits. These are all things that help with that security issue, whether you want to call it cybersecurity or not. Um, and, you know, we continue. I, as I tell people all the time, I'm, I'm constantly being uh, interviewed on the national press, and I tell them, you know, cybersecurity is like a, a race without a finish line. It's never going to end. It's the new normal for our secretaries of state. This is what we face going forward. We have to be focused on it on an everyday basis. Last August, August 24th to be exact, my IT manager came to me and said, uh, we blocked a whole bunch of uh, attempts to get into our system yesterday. And I said, okay. And he goes, I want you to see these two. And he gave me a document, and in both of them, it said country of origin, Russia. So I immediately said, okay, you're sure we blocked it? And he said, yes, there's nothing in the system. I said, okay, then we need to send this down to the Department of Homeland Security. By the end of that day, they, they received it, and what's called an MSISAC, which is an information sharing analysis center um, uh, at the Center for Internet Security. By the time they finished that day, they had issued an uh, alert across the country to all states to be on the lookout for these IP addresses. So we played a hand in that, and I'm pleased that we were, but I also am very pleased, obviously, that our systems worked, our defenses worked. Um, um, Secretary? Yes. Um, I I, uh, well, going through voter registration files this, this year, um, I noticed there was a lot of um, a lot of folks that were born in 1915 or something like that. I can't remember. It was it was a it was a it was a lot of people and um, that have been voting regularly over the last six years, uh, last ten years. And the reason I came upon it was because I actually talked to somebody um, who said they hadn't voted in ten years, but had a voting record, um, and that's why I was at their door. I, I think I did talk to the Secretary of State's office about this because uh, it felt like a security, uh, um, a potential security issue. I, I figured there must be a very simple explanation for why there's a bunch of people that are born in 1905 and 1915 on their voter registration. Process. Well, I can't speak to the 1905. 1915, those people, <coughs> some of those people are still around. <laughs> some of those are still around, yeah. And, um, and they're good voters. But uh, I will say that uh, uh, the system, you know, we. Secretaries of State across the country are criticized because there's dead people on the election voter reg registration databases. Um, there will always be dead people on the voter registration databases. And part of it is because the, the dead people, unfortunately, don't call us up or send us a document saying, right. I died, don't take me off the list. Plus, if you, if you get rid of them, you know. And, <laughs> and, no and there are restrictions, yeah. and, and actually the restrictions about taking people off the ballot, off the uh, registration database, we have to follow federal guidelines, and it isn't easy to take someone off, and, and frankly, it shouldn't be easy. Um, so, you know, we have the capability now when we are doing an audit to make sure that, you know, nobody voted more than twice and all this stuff. But let me put it in perspective. In 2016, because we haven't got the final numbers yet for this year, but in 2016, 68%, and that was a presidential year, 68% of our registered voters voted. 68%. I really have a tough enough time getting people to vote once, never mind twice. So uh, it, it's, um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say to you there is no voter fraud whatsoever. What I will say to you is there is no widespread voter fraud. And, and frankly, from my standpoint, and I think most of my team will agree to when I say the real voter fraud in this country is denying an eligible American the right to cast a ballot. And that happens far more than any occasion of actual voter fraud where someone's impersonating someone. I appreciate that work in our election. Mr. Secretary, um, uh, we both know Cassie Barbo. Um, after the election, she expressed some frustration uh, with me and was worried, frankly, about uh, same-day registration 
and how the state does not <coughs> does not require someone to provide ID. And I find that troublesome. Well, first let me say that ID would not stop someone in that case. But we could determine their address. Um, if they, yeah, well, here's the thing. If someone moves into Bennington the day before, should they be denied? And they wouldn't have That's a driver's a license. They wouldn't have a utility bill at that point. And in some cases where you have three or four people living together in, a, in an apartment, um, only one person probably has a utility bill. So the, the others wouldn't have a utility bill. So it's, it's really difficult. And you, if you look at the Vermont law, it, it's, it, it tells us how we can go about this. As I said, we find it very difficult to find. Uh, there's, there's an argument about same day because the ones that use same day most often are college students. All right? That is, that is something that we have to still consider. Now, this was the first general election with same day. So it was the first time. And I can tell you that the numbers so far are there statewide. We had 8,000 people that voted, that registered and voted on, on election day. Um, that doesn't mean that those people didn't deserve to be. Voting is a constitutional right. You should be allowed, you, we should reduce and remove any obstructions that are in the way while we still have um, requirements uh, as to making sure. You sign an affidavit when you, when you register. You sign an affidavit. And if you are convicted of voter fraud. I wasn't aware of that. So when they, it's the same day they sign an affidavit. Well, the, the application is actually an affidavit. Penalties of perjury. By the way, Cassie Barbaro is our town clerk. Didn't mention that. that so, didn't yeah, know. no, I'm, and, I, and I'm aware of Cassie's um, concerns mm -hmm. uh, because you you do have a college in your town. And so I understand that. So, you know, Burlington has, I think they had 2,500 or 3,000 same day voter registrations that, that day. Um, but same-day voter registration also offers that protection to voters whose name might, for some reason, have been removed from the checklist. Now, we don't remove them. It's really up to Cassie and, and her colleagues across the state. The, the way our system works is the town clerk is the one responsible for their voter checklist. So they add and remove. If someone files with our office online, uh, it goes automatically to the clerk of jurisdiction, and that clerk has to review it and approve it before it gets added to the list. Then it gets fed up into the statewide. One follow-up. One follow -up. Um, is there any way currently, maybe, Cassie's argument was that uh, somebody could come into my town and go to Shaftesbury, and uh, there, there may or may not be any cross-referencing. Is there a way for the Secretary of State to check for duplication? Um, um, yes. Yeah. Not on... Uh, Unfortunately, unless they're, they're online at, at, at the polling place, they can't do it from there. Um, but that's probably in the future will uh, be allowed. Um, but there, the, vote, the statewide voter checklist is it's online. They can, they can access it. The, the town clerks have access to the overall, and they can look to see if someone is registered in another town. And when they find someone, if someone is registering, like if someone's registering in, in Bennington and they moved there from Shaftesbury, she can actually click and send notice to that town clerk to remove this person they just registered in Bennington. So that's available to them. Um, there are some, um, it, it, one of the things that we will be coming to the legislature for, there is a, there is a, um, uh, a, a group, an organization, it's actually state-owned, and I say that it's, 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 there's 26 states, I think, that are in it now. Uh, it's growing. Um, it's called ERIC, and it's Electronic uh, electronic Registration Information system, uh, Center or something. And basically, what happens is the states will send their voter registration data to this group and they will massage it within their system of the, of the consortium states and decide if there's people that should be removed like dead people people that have moved because we don't have any system between states there's no system between states all right 
So, um, but there are ways that we can find out some of this stuff. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to thank you. Um, your website's amazing, and I spent way too much time on it in the last six months. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's incredibly easy to use, and I was glad to hear that you're hosting a business portal because I think that goes well, given the same technology in Vermont. Um, and thinking about workforce development and how many disconnected workers I think we have right now who are trying to find their way, um, and how sort of different government systems are really challenging for those folks. I think things like ease of voter registration is a really great way to start to get people connected to state systems enough that they might think about sort of next steps of employment or housing or something like that. So um, I think any way that we can connect people to a sense of community and voting is a really good one of those. Um, we might be able to grow the workforce from there. So thank you. For thank that you. Too. Is it the town clerk's responsibility or the BCA's responsibility to manage the uh, checklist? Well, both. Um, the town clerks receive stuff on a regular basis, and, and they actually can, can do well, it. I'm on, yeah, and, but the Board of yeah, Civil Authority the ultimately, clerk, yeah, <laughs> the Board of Civil Authority ultimately has the authority. Yeah, because the town clerk gives us that information. And, and she's a we, member of that. We add, and she's a member, but we... Well, yeah. yeah. Typically, um, you know, when I was in South Burlington um, on the city council there, we were on uh, obviously on the uh, Board of Civil Authority as well, and um, we would receive, the, the town clerk would say, give us a list and say, here's here's the people that I'm removing. Challenges uh, and, yeah. Or, or adding or yeah. whatever, and, and we would get a chance to look at it and say, yeah, yeah or, or we think this person still lives there. You know, that's the thing. You don't want to remove someone if they still live there just because they didn't vote because you don't know when they're going to vote. Yeah. So it, it, it's wrong to just take someone off the list. And that's what Same Day offers the opportunity to protect that person. Thanks, Gary. Um, so this is actually a follow-up on um, Richard's point earlier. Um, uh, so the Same Day registration, really happy that exists and that we're doing that, um, all about open and transparent elections. Our, our uh, clerks are struggling with the additional time that comes with it. Um, and, and I heard some complaints from constituents about not being able to register to vote the day before the election because money was closed, the offices were closed uh, to prepare with uh, the uh, folks that voted early and things like that. Um, so it seems that a, that a fix there would be to provide some additional funding for our election workers to either hire somebody to come help on that day. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the cost of elections are, if there's overtime that boosts that cost. and. And, um, but it, it does seem that our election workers need help. Um, and, it, and I think I've heard some frustration that, um, now I'm forgetting the name of the person that's from each party that's supposed to be there and help with the elections, but some frustration that progressives are not going to be part of that. But. Well, l let me just say, first of all, let me say there are duties listed in the statute about what the Board of Civil Authority, what their job titles or duties are. And uh, we get complaints all the time from people that say, from clerks who say, I can't get some of my members of the Board of Civil Authority to do anything on Election Day. They don't want anything to do with it. Well, my only response to that is then they probably shouldn't be a Board of Civil Authority member okay. if they're not going to do what they're supposed to do. Um, second, I think um, there are um, th this, this issue of, of we don't pay the town clerks or the towns for their labor or the work that they do at that level. We do pay, if a town is a, we have 246 towns, we have 135 of them are what we call tabulator towns. They have a, a tabulator machine. Um, those 135 towns, uh, which is a little over 50% of the towns, um, actually generate or receive 80% of the votes that come through. There is a state law uh, that the legislature had passed several years ago that any town of a thousand voters or more must have a tabulator. We provide that tabulator. It doesn't cost the town anything to purchase that tabulator, so we provide that. Uh, we also provide the first 500 for the, the memory card um, uh, creation, uh, which typically is about 1,200, I think. It, it depends on the election and how many people are on it and all that stuff, but it's about $1,000 to $1,200. We pay the first 500 of that. Um, and if there's a recount, 
we end up footing the bill on that as well. Um, the, the the whole idea, I mean, we now have data. We didn't have data before, but we do now with our new election management system that was put in place in 2015. Um, and for instance, we can tell you uh, that before you used to have to register, and the close of registration was the Wednesday before the election day. We now know that from the Thursday, Friday, Monday, and the election day, we can tell you how many people. And for instance, it was, this year, I think it was close to 13,000 people during that week that voted um, it'd be early. Um, we know that there's 8,000 people that, that registered and voted on the same day, uh, on election day. We know that the day before elections, there were 7,000, over 7,000 people that actually voted uh, that day, uh, early ballot. Um, and, and I know that many of the clerks wanted us to give them a get what we call it, what they call a gap day, where there would be no registration, no uh, voting in that one day, the day before elections. With numbers like that, it's kind of hard to say, what are we supposed to do with those people that are voting early? Um, and, and in fact, um, a Republican member of the Senate actually said, well, I think they ought to be open on Saturday um, before Election Day. Um, there is one of the things we, we are we always run into is, is that here in Vermont, you have some professional clerks who are open five days a week. And we also have some clerks in some small towns that are only open one afternoon a week or one day a week. Um, Mr. Chairman, what, are you open five days or? Uh, three half days, but we have a town administrator who is also yeah. an assistant clerk, so it, it basically is open five days. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it varies across the state, and I don't think there's any question. Now, I will tell you that there's a bill in Congress, H.R. 1, that would require a minimum of 15 days of early voting, including weekends. Um, I don't believe that that bill will go anywhere at this point, but uh, it is there, and there is a growing support for at least the weekend before elections to be open. And I know that several of the, of the towns uh, here in Montpelier, uh, John Odom, will be open on Saturday until I think 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the Saturday before Election Day, to register people and allow people to come in and vote. Um, it, it's just. We allow 45 days for early voting, but that doesn't mean 45 days where the clerk is actually available. We also have an online request system where you can actually request your early ballot to be mailed to you uh, as soon as 45 days ahead of time. Um, so, you know, we're offering as many ways possible for people to be able to register and cast a, a ballot. I will tell you that. The, the numbers are 75 percent of all the registrations for 2018, January through December, um, 75 percent of those registrations came through the online voter registration system, the um, uh, election day registration system, the automatic voter registration system, which is our uh, AVR is with the DMV, so we receive a nightly file from DMV for anybody that accessed DMV that day. Um, and if, you know, we check it against our system to see if anybody, and if they didn't opt out, we will automatically register. If they're 17 years old, um, but will be 18 by election day, we will automatically register them because they're eligible to vote in the presidential primary um, and, and, the, and the general election primary. Uh, and if, if they're 16 um, and, or they're 17 and they won't be eligible, we actually, in essence, pre-register and we park them off to the side until their birth date pops up and then we automatically will register them. So we're doing everything we can to get people on. And that's not a bad thing. No, not at all. And I, and I didn't mean to say that there was No, I, I don't mean it in uh, that way. Just, uh, just, if it's okay, J uh, just that uh, um, when we do provide those options, recognizing that our clerks are feeling overwhelmed despite that we have all these options. There's still a lot of, as you said, 8,000 people who registered today, same day, but also the write-in votes 
make it challenging for them. I'm, ju I'm just wanting to communicate that, yep. that there's some... Oh, no, and, and we recognize that. And, in fact, everything that I've been doing with our new election system, and by the way, just to give you a background on our new election system, our management system, when I took office, we were 38th in the nation in 2012. That was the first election I oversaw, 38th in the nation. After the court. For elections uh, performance index, it's a data driven. It's now done by uh, MIT. It's the most coveted of the election uh, election performance indicators. So we were 38th in the nation. Um, we have we started right after 2012 putting stuff online, online voter registration, things like that, um, and we've crept up the list. 2000 after the 2014 election, we were 16th in the nation. After the 2016 election, we were number one. Congratulations. So I'm um, very proud of our team, the work that they've done to uh, implement. Uh, and much of that information comes from what's called the EAC report, which is an Elections Assistance Commission report. It's a federal commission. Um, and the clerks used to have to fill this report out. It was 40 pages long. Um, and it had to be done within 60 days of the election. Uh, required a lot of data points in it. Um, they hated it. We hated it because then they would send it to us, so we would receive 245 <coughs> reports. We had to uh, aggregate it into one report and then supply it to the federal government. Um, what we did when we put our new election management system in place was, if as long as the clerks are doing their job, we have the information. We can just click a button and the report is filed. Uh, so we've taken that off their plate. A lot of the registration, voter registration stuff, we've taken off their plate actually. We've, we've reduced the amount of work that they have to do. So we've been working on the other side too. And, and I know that a lot of folks don't hear that from the town clerks, but and that, that's not a knock on them. They're busy. They're the hardest working municipal officials we have. And I'm sorry for those that are select board members. I was myself. <laughs> but the clerks are the hardest working municipal officials we have and uh, um, it, it, it's a, it's a constant battle and, and you know we're trying to find ways that we can improve uh, the efficiency and, and accuracy and you know the fact that we used to get paper literally paper forms that, for voter registration and send it to the clerks because if they came to our office we would send it to the appropriate clerk and those paper forms had so much inaccuracy on it because you have to try to read someone's chicken scratch. Right, yeah. <laughs> Whereas now with the online system uh, and, and, and the automatic voter registration system, that stuff is automatically updated. Right. So our system is far more accurate today than it ever was. We don't have an answer for dead people dying on us. Uh, we don't have an answer for people that move out of state. Within the state, we do. Within the state, we do. Um, and and um, it's just it's just a constant battle. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I guess a, maybe it's a question and then a, a shorter point of view. Um, when we voted on the same day voting, I checked with my town clerk, and she said that basically we've had it all along anyway. It's called a provisional ballot. Um, I don't know. Now that's not just one thing I would ask you. To, that's what I understood from her. She yeah. treats it like a provisional ballot. The second thing I wanted to know was, um, are there any rules on how you use the voter rolls for other state functions? I mean, I know like the jury duty was often taken off of voter rolls in the DMV. And there is, is state there, law. Yeah. And what and, are the restrictions? And uh, I don't have it on the top of my head, but I do know that at least once a year we have to send a copy of the voter roll to the judiciary. Um, I'm assuming it's jury duty issue, issues, but uh, um, I, I will say it's, it, the, the provisional ballot, Vermont has not used a provisional ballot for years. Mm -hmm. We've used what we call an affidavit, and um, the affidavit basically, if someone came in and said, well, I registered through human services, mm -hmm. here, fill out this form, and you attest to the fact that under pains and penalty, penalties of pains and perjury, that uh, that you actually did do this. And what what actually occurred at one point was, um, this is after the 2012, I think it was, election. Uh, two weeks after the election was over, 
I got a stack like this from DMV of voter mm -hmm. registration mm -hmm. forms, um, and I called Rob Iot up, the commissioner, and I just said, I, you got to come over and see this. And these things dated back to July. Mm -hmm. So somewhere these things were being held yeah. and not getting to us. So it was two weeks after the election that we finally got this information. So we started working with DMV to improve that, but we still have other designated agencies, Human Services, the Health Connect, uh, are considered health, uh, designated registration agencies as well. We don't get a lot from those agencies. Most of it comes from DMV. Um, um, you know, people remember to change their address mm -hmm. on their driver's license, yeah. but not yeah, not for their voter rolls. Um, and it's it it just uh, it's just a you know we're we're constantly dealing with that. But now with the, the automatic voter. It actually, which by the way, and, and you might remember this, um, Representative Dickinson, when, when uh, it actually was passed, it passed the House unanimous, it passed the Senate unanimous, they made one slight change, it had to come back to the House, there was one no vote in the, in the House uh, on that last and final vote, and it had nothing to do with the bill itself. It had to be that the person that voted no was upset with the person that was reporting the bill. <laughs> <laughs> Two things. One, what is the name of the, the, the award that you won? Because I want to write a little blurb about it. The other thing is general opinion on mail ballots. I know that like the, what they do in the state of Washington, because Washington ends up with a voter turnout of somewhere around seventy percent on a regular basis. So. Any opinions on that? But first, give me the name of you. You were number one. It's the this. the elections performance index that's put together by the MIT Election and Security Data Center. And that was after the 2016 election. It takes almost two years before they actually uh, produce that report. So we won't know mm -hmm. about the 2018 election until sometime next year, just prior to the election. It comes out usually in August, September time frame of Thank the election year. So mail ballots. Um, there are three states that do all mail ballots. And what they do is they basically send a ballot to every registered voter on their, uh, th that they have in their system. Um, and, and people that can mail it back, they can bring it back to a polling location, they can also go to what they call a vote center where they just drop it off at a vote center. Um, mail ballots do have a tendency to have higher um, participation rates, um, it, uh, but I will tell you that the state that has the highest percentage mm -hmm. is Minnesota, and they have for many years now. They've been in the mid to high 70s. Um, they just have a different approach to elections in, in, in Minnesota, and, but it's Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. Um, don't be fooled by the comments that it might be cheaper to do it that way than to have to do it the other way because first think about it this way, you got to mail a ballot to every, not 68% as we had voted, but to 100%. Uh, you have postage that has to be paid for, um, both going and coming back. Um, uh, so that there are costs to it, and, and I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do. I actually, we do have a, we're kind of a hybrid because we do allow mail ballots. So if you, if you request your early vote ballot, you can actually, you can request it by mail and you can receive it and then send it back by mail. Um, but it's, it, so we're kind of in the middle uh, between that. We have about 30% of our uh, electorate or 30 percent of the votes cast are cast by um, uh, early ballots. Uh, we have no no excuse absentee, uh, and you know there are states that have like in in New Hampshire they do not have early voting. They do not have uh, no excuse uh, absentee. You have to have a reason, uh, and they force you to come in on election day. I don't even know what their percentage is. Uh, I think one of the problems we would test. Everyone votes on Tuesday. Are there any states that have looked at? State elections on other days? Well, uh, if you're talking about the general election, it would be difficult to do that because it's federal yeah, it races. Like thing, yeah, uh, many states have tried. I mean, South Burlington used to be, we used to vote on the third Tuesday of May. 
Um, and then they moved it. And the reason why they did that was because at that back in those days, it would take that long for the legislature to decide how much money was going to be set to them for schools. So South Burlington voted third Tuesday of, of uh, May, and then they realized it didn't make much of a difference, so they moved it. And, and the vote uh, percentages were down for that we called our town meeting. Um, so they moved it to the same as town meeting, and the vote percentage didn't change. We've had other states, uh, other towns, I think Milton may have done it for a while, uh, where they were voting on Saturday, didn't change their percentages. Um, people have tried at different times and, and whatever. Uh, I know Congress, there's a, uh, in fact, I just got an email this morning uh, from Senator, from uh, Representative Welch that uh, there's a bill being presented to make uh, Tuesday, Election Day, a holiday. Um, he asked what my opinion was, and I said, great idea. I don't know if it'll pass, but it's a great idea. Um, you know, there, I, there was a House member just yesterday said to me, you know, I'm going to put a bill in that, that requires businesses to give two hours of uh, uh, time off, paid time off, to go vote on Election Day. Well, I, I think in most cases, I'm not even sure, but we might already have that on the books. Um, I, I think it might be on the books. I'm not sure. I know they, can, they can't stop you from going to vote. I'm not sure if it's con considered paid time off or if you have to use leave time to do it. But uh, you know, there are so many things that people are looking at to try to increase the number of voters participating. Um, anecdotally, uh, so the, the town I'm from has had a lot of uh, road construction this year. So we had two, uh, we call them, I think the town clerk called them mobile um, early primary, early voting up for primary and for the regular. And, and so and we had this huge, turnout on Saturdays. And um, the, the comments from, of course, I was out there, you know, so, um, but, and, and the comments from every person coming by was that they just love being able to vote on Saturday. And we had a really big bump up in our, mm -hmm. in, in, in our, in our voter turnout. I'm not saying it yeah. doesn't work, but yeah, it was just, great. it's, yeah. you know, it, and every city or town might be different. You, you don't know. It's, it's, um, uh, the, the one thing I can say is we have to have a finite date at some point. Uh, for instance, we do not accept any ballots that are received after 7 p.m. on election night. Even if someone were to mail it back and, and it's postmarked ahead of time, we don't accept it. It's seven, it has to be in the hands of the clerk by 7 p.m. on election night uh, for it to count. And that's not trying to you know, diminish it, but that's just the way it is. We have, we've been working to improve, uh, I'm on a, a co-chair committee with the Secretary of State from uh, uh, Wyoming, uh, with, I'm sorry, Washington, State of Washington, um, on overseas and military votes uh, for uh, Council of State Governments. Um, and, and our biggest obstacle is the post office. Uh, we actually had a case, it was sent to me uh, in New Hampshire, someone had put the, they actually had a picture of their envelope where it said, un, 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 address not, or un, 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 undeliverable, um, and if you looked at the address and then looked at what the Department of Defense uh, regs put in for that, for the state of New, of New Hampshire, but if you, if you also go to their website and look at it, it was the correct address, but for some reason the post office deemed it as undeliverable. And I immediately sent it to the um, person on our committee from the post office to find out what's going on. Do you send uh, the list of the uh, checklist to the motor vehicle, given that a uh, person who registers vote has 60 days to get a Vermont license? No. That's not something that, that we're involved with. So, uh, can I get, get off elections for a moment? Sure. Great. So, in terms of licensing, um, because with a contractor licensing, I just have a question: If anybody, is there any other profession that requires only a registration? The secretary. Not said? that we have. Very few. There may there may be one or two out there. Okay. Um, so, is there anybody that started as a registration automatically went to licensure? 
No, that's always a, a comprehensive review either through the Sunrise process or yeah. by this body. I can think of, say, athletic trainers started out as a, as a certification and then went to a, a licensure at some point, as an okay. example. But yeah. it's um, it's never just an automatic jump. It's something that is thought through and, carefully. Okay. And just to take it one step further, we've also had requests, like, for instance, from the legislature to uh, license um, because of various issues that have occurred from massage therapists. Yes. Yeah. And we've done two reports on it to the legislature, two Sunrise Reviews, and in both we don't recommend it. Uh, that it's The issue for, for most people was to try to stop uh, the nefarious stuff from going on at massage therapies, or massage therapists, and frankly, that's there's already laws on the book for that. Having a licensure system isn't going to necessarily solve that problem. Right. And you should focus your attention on solving the, the crime, so to speak, versus solving the licensure issue. So we've we've not um, chosen, and the legislature has not chosen after receiving the reports, to license um, massage therapists. And it, it comes up every couple of years. Yeah. So seeing the state of professional and occupational licensure across the country, we are really lucky that we have the Sunrise statute that we do. It's the envy of a lot of those other states. So that's what I'm getting called to go um, talk to other states about. I've talked to teams in Wisconsin and Illinois, <coughs> Arizona, and Florida about this because they want Vermont's Sunrise statute to help control somewhat out of control professional regulation in other states. Okay. The, and there is there's a legitimate concern about um, overextending uh, the level of licensure and what professions you actually license. Some people, you would be shocked at some of the professions that are licensed. Yeah, I just have a couple more questions. Uh, so actually, since we started, I actually did my annual renewal for my corporation, so thank you for that online. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I was paying attention. Um, you used the one click? One I did, click. I did. It didn't work, so I had to go back. And, but it, it was wonderful anyway. Um, but the, uh, we heard from the Department of Labor earlier about 23,000 employers, but I think that's covered employees, not necessarily a number of sole proprietors doing business. So I wonder if, uh, do you, you have stats on number of sole proprietors and that kind of stuff as well that are active, are they filed every year? Are you asking about the annual This is Marlene Batiste. Yeah, yeah. We have numbers of annual reports, and that does break down by entity type. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. To right. some degree, and then at a certain point, we would be able to break it down any further. Okay, so you have that annual report. Is that it's probably on the website? No doubt. We can. It's actually a, a data-driven report, so we can look into that and pull it. And if we can't pull it, our vendor can. That'd be great. Okay, thanks. And I had only one more question: UCC filing still done at the town level? Some. Some. And some with us. The okay. vast majority are done with us. Yeah. Um, and that that's a lean. so. You know, I talked a little bit about the annual report and how long it used to take. To register a new business used to take anywhere from 10 to 15 days, yeah. and now it's done in less than 30 minutes. Uh, to uh, file a UCC lien uh, a claim uh, used to take five to seven days to receive, process, and, and uh, post. It's now done instantaneously. Uh, so we've really improved that efficiency. That's, that's why our agency, for the most part, has really stayed relatively stable uh, as far as staffing, although we are maxing out at this point. Uh, we've taken on so much more uh, that we are going to probably need a couple more bodies. But um, it's it's if if you go back to what was called the SEA report, which was back in 2003 or four, it was the Strategic Enterprise Initiative at SEI, Strategic Enterprise Initiative and then Challenges for Change in 2008 and 9. Uh, both of those said there was this large bubble of state employees moving through there, with, uh, approaching uh, retirement, and that there was going to be a huge problem when all that happens. Uh, and unfortunately, that what was happening was that the state figured, oh, well, we can start reducing our staffing without the corresponding uh, investment in, in, in technology to offset it and as I said earlier you know we've almost doubled the amount of work that we do with the same number of employees 
Um, and, you know, I mean, whenever we have an opening in, in, in our shop, I ask three questions of my directors, and Chris can tell you because I used to ask it of him. One, do we need that position? Do we need it doing what it's currently doing? Or do we need it doing something else? And I would not just fill a position just because it became vacant. I wanted to do an analysis to determine what are our needs, our actual needs. And, and if you looked at the org chart for the Office of Professional Regulation in 2010 when I came in on to today, it's unrecognizable, it's so different. Uh, the way we've reorganized the office. I remember as a banker, it was a pain in the ass to take those things out. <laughs> could make a mistake, have to do it all over again. Yeah. Well, I, Marlene could tell you we also had a problem, and, and, and Chris Delia, we had a problem at one point where um, we, had, we had just gone to the online system, and all of a sudden we had to pull down the UCCs uh, because. Um, Back in around 2001 or two or someplace, we had taken off uh, tax ID numbers and, and social security numbers. We'd taken them off the form, but a lot of the banks <laughs> were sticking it in the comment section, or and we didn't, or writing it on the side of the form, and we were just scanning the forms and putting them up. So we had to go back and then redact all those. And I mean, we're talking about several million uh, forms that had to be looked at. So. We were fortunate we had a, we hired a vendor that could do a lot of it uh, automatically, so. Could you, could you just state your name for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. Marlene Batik, B-E-T-A. Thank you. Um, when you review the professional regulations, do you check for um, felony status? Because I know there's a few, um, cosmetology, for instance, I know used to um, be disqualified. Sure. I, let me answer. Yeah. <clears throat> Chris Winters, for the record. I was the director of professional regulation before I became the deputy secretary. So I know a little bit about professional regulation. Um, we can, and it's a may, not a shall, deny an applicant for conviction of a crime related to the practice of the profession or conviction of a felony that's not even related in any way. We look at things like rehabilitation and you know the type of crime and how long ago it was. So it's grounds to deny, but it doesn't always result in a denial. Um, and then separately, do you collect the demographic data on um, each person who's certified or registered? Very little on okay. professional regulation. And very little on corporations as well. We've had requests before about how many women-owned businesses are there. Right? wasn't required by the legislature. Thank you. We, we follow the law that's in front of us. <laughs> oh, oh. Bring it back to elections, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just curious, I, uh, I know if Keith Stern didn't have to, well, uh, there's this new ethics regulation, everybody has to file their financial disclosures, but my understanding, Keith Stern never did and that there are several candidates that never really have. It, it, so it, it just it just seems like if that's a requirement, but then people aren't required to actually do it to, to run for office. Is there a means of actually enforcing this? Um, no. Do you know what I'm, do you know what I'm you know? No, the simple answer is no, that the legislature did not put a uh, penalty if they didn't follow it. Um, uh, the financial disclosure form itself, most people did file, um, and we, we've since taken down the candidates page, which is where those were, but we're going to put back the financial disclosures of, of the, if you want to call it the winners. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the statewides had to file also their 1040. They could redact certain information, but uh, they had to file a 1040. Um, and Keith Stern was the only one that did not file, uh, but there's no penalty. If I remember the debate correctly, there was a lot of discussion about maybe keeping people off the ballot if they didn't do that, but the uh, yeah, Ledge didn't. Council said there were constitu constitutional issues with that, perhaps, and that public shaming would hopefully be enough, and you can see that didn't quite work. Yeah, it didn't work for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? We're, we're going to have an opportunity to ask you questions about the specific 
report on the coral. Oh, yes. Yes, okay, great. Yeah, we're planning to come back for that. It was nice work. Thank you. It, uh, credit Alex. He did most of that work. So, all right. Anything else? Very good. Uh, well, committee, uh, you actually got a chance to understand what DevOps goes through also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because a lot of what the Secretary of State does doesn't concern us as a committee, just the business part of it. But um, I'm glad that we were able to have the time with you and, and to go through everything. And everyone had a chance to. Uh, understand everything that you do it's pretty extensive so. and we're pretty flexible we can get over here pretty quickly um, you know give us some time if you want a, a good report but uh, uh, you know uh, it's it's uh, you know we work with the legislature I mean that's you know, don't forget I was one of you guys at one time so and I'm Jim's eyes and ears over here. I spend a lot more time over here than he does, so just feel free. By design. Any, any <laughs> questions? <laughs> it's a good thing. Any questions for uh, for Jim or for about the Secretary of State's office? I'm always happy to help in any way that I can, or just call or email. Great. Well, we'll we'll go back in soon to have a real deep discussion on the greatest portal, but that's really exciting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks.